Legends. Welcome back to the Noob Spiro Podcast. Welcome if you're here for the first time. My name is Shrek and this is the Noob Spiro Podcast. It's interviews with spearfishing experts, authorities and characters from around the world. This time we're in the Central Coast. It's Simon Horvath. If nothing else, this interview is a massive call to join a club and get involved at least uh, filling in stuff to preserve our fishing rights and our spearfishing access. Uh, really cool interview talking about some of the stuff Simon's been involved with. Uh, really nice guy and a member of the Central Coast Sea Lions. Fantastic club down there. Next week, I actually chat with all of the Central Coast. We have a bit of a round table and uh, that's a cracker interview as well. So enjoy today's part three East Coast invasion. It's my trip south with my good mate Cam. This is our part three, um, as I said, uh, in Simon's place, interviewing him. He's an awesome bloke. Um, guys, I wanted to quickly, I, I told Trevor I'd um, put the word out there a couple of weeks ago and I haven't followed through. If you jump on, go fund me. Go to the Inter-Pacific Spearfishing Team Fundraising uh, and check that out. There's the, Basically, the Aussie team want to go and compete and it costs a lot of money to go overseas and compete. These guys are trying to raise some money. Check that out. Go fund me. Type in Inter-Pacific Spearfishing Team Fundraising. Help those guys get over there and compete. Some absolute legends going, including Trevor himself, one of my favorite men in spearfishing. Uh, a very good character. And his YouTube channel, Submerged Psychos, you might know him from that. Uh, very, very funny. He's a very eccentric man, and I really like him. So please get on, support him on their GoFundMe. That's it for shout-outs this week. I was going to put out a quick word, though. If you ever want to submit a voice message, tell me a story, uh, like a lesson learned or a new bit of kit you've got, something you're excited about in the spearfishing world, or even what makes you froth on the Noob Spirit podcast, I'd love it if you do that. Go to noobspirit.com, head up into the menu, and find the Nooba story section. You can record a voice message there. Around that one minute, one and a half minute mark is absolutely perfect. If you want to go a bit longer, you can. There's a maximum thing of three minutes there. But hey, check it out. Let's get into today's interview. Simon Horvath, the man's a legend. Here we go. Neptonics.com source the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Jerry says, if we sell it, we believe in it, we trust it and dive it. Neptonics is the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing essentials. Neptonics is solid gear that works, and you'll know it's true when you pull the trigger on a Neptonics mech. On every snap of a Neptonics power band and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. Buy gear you can depend on at neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. Adreno.com.au, the home of recipes, blogs, videos, equipment reviews, and an obnoxiously large range of spearfishing equipment for frothers like you. Not only that, but spearfishing trips and courses, courses and trips that I sometimes get to go on. Check them out at adreno.com.au. It's a Spiro's best friend. Check them out, and if you want to buy gear, pump in the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can use that online, in-store, Use the code NoobSpiro, save some cash, and support the NoobSpiro podcast. Shop with adreno.com.au. So Cameron and I are midway through our East Coast adventure from Brisbane to Sydney. We've stopped in at an absolute legend's place. His name's Simon Horvath. He has been uh, very active in Australian spearfishing. Many people do not know him. He's not a comp diver. He, well, maybe he's been in comps, but he's not a you know he's not a well a well known comp diver or anything like that. Very much probably more of a social diver, just like you and me, um, for, or the, for the most part. And uh, but doing a lot of things, he has done a lot of things for Spiros and protecting their their access and stuff like that. So Simon, mate, we've been in touch over the years. Welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast. Thanks very much for having me, and thank you for joining us today in this uh, rainy weather. <laughs> yeah, we we're getting smoked like um, La Nina is gripping the uh, the uh, east coast. Yeah, and on the coast here, we've had uh, you know hundreds and hundreds of mills. Um, Months and months of rain on and off and big swells. We've had uh, to contend with major river systems that flush out in our area, um, the Hawkesbury being the main one. So we've ended up with uh, a lot of undivable days and a couple of uh, sad postponed and cancelled <laughs> comps for the for the club. But that's all right. You know, we're, we're keeping the stoke alive as much as possible yeah. and um, trying to join, uh, keep everyone excited. And, and we're really excited to hopefully a bit of weather calming down and moving on from there. 
Mate, we've um, you're a bit spoiled in this part of the world. The Central Coast Sea Lions are a fantastic club. They sp- support the Noob Sparrow podcast as patrons. I've had um, Albie on the show before, yep. um, but you guys are very well represented in terms of, uh, you know, being involved in your own community but also in the broader sort of spearfishing conversation. So, yeah. Yeah, we sure are. We had, um, you know, the one exciting thing about a club, uh, you can forget about comps, is just the experience that everyone has. You know, there's people that have been diving for a year or two years and there's people who have been diving for 15, 25, up to 40 years. So if you combine the knowledge in each club, you could have, you know, four or five hundred years of experience of diving um, that those people get to hand out to you. And if you're lucky enough and, you know, um, respectful and, and, you know, turn up and enjoy and help out, uh, you get to have some experiences that I would have never have had. You know, we had, um, you know, I remember the first away trip and even just going up north to Nelson Bay and, you know, going in some comps up there, um, you know, shooting first big king, you know, just wouldn't, wouldn't have happened without the club. Um, mm. The club offered me so much. So we, you know, uh, you know, I joined f- seven years ago. Yeah. Um, maybe, f- yeah, five, seven years ago. Um, club offered me heaps, really got me, you know, out of a, you know, a personal situation where I just got s- so much enjoyment. Um, you know, I was uh, a little bit... Uh, you know, lost my way a little bit and um, it just fulfilled this thing and gave so much to me and I automatically wanted to give back. Mm. You know, I rose up through the ranks as a, you know, this part of this, per- this you know, person in the committee and that person in the committee ended up as president and then, in, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, they, they vote you in because they think you'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then 2018 got thrust upon us and that was, uh, you know, a turning point. Um I, I got to learn and do some crazy things. Um, we had even created a little group locally with, you know, the local charter, the local pro, the spearfishing club, the line fishing club. We had, you know, thousands of people. We had the meetings where we had two, three, four, five hundred 500 people turn up. Um, wow. Yeah, it was just... And this was around the Hawkesbury Marine Park. Plant. Yeah, the, bio, yeah. the Hawkesbury Marine Park bioregion. Um, so... Which was, it was, they were essentially going to shut out 90% of the grounds for basic shore diving. Yeah, well, on on our end of the coast, um, it was depending on exactly how you wanted to look at what you consider access or not, whether it's collecting or line fishing or spear fishing, um, over three quarters of all the sanctuary zones were on the central coast and it would have been, depending on where you live on the coast, up to 90% of your shore access on the central coast um, lost for spear fishing grounds and some of the most productive grounds, not only for spearos but everyone else. Um, and, yeah, we were just uh, not yeah. going to have that. <laughs> well, you had a number of issues with it and, and let's point out some of, the, some of the, the, the reasons why it was not a good idea. Like, so, I mean, I remember looking at it and it wasn't really an evidence-based approach. They weren't doing it because of a, a plethora of research that was saying, hey, do this. Yeah, look, um, we... Well, I and a few other people, um, we even went into the to the point of doing a Gipper, which is a freedom of information request. We wanted to. We were sitting around in the club one night, going, "How did they come to this? Like, what's what's the magic formula? Why is it we get to lose this much ground? What's it about?" Um, and there was, you know, in the very end, it ended up being a program that used um, cost, cost benefit, um, cost and benefit analysis and uh, in the end we even got some excuses like, oh, there's less population on the central coast so we thought we'd take more. Um, and even some of the zones... That's a terrible rationale. Yeah. <laughs> um, and even some of the zones were uh, didn't even have any environmental value on their own program. It was essentially for stand-up paddle boarders and snorkelers. Um, for yeah, so that was uh, quite surprising. Um, and, you know, we, we got all the way to the minister's office. Um, we got people talking to their local members. Like most people should think if the government's doing the right job, you shouldn't have your local member's number. You shouldn't know where their office is and you shouldn't have to send them an email yeah. and, a, and a text message and plan a meeting. But we had all that happening. So, yeah, yeah. it's um, a huge thanks to, you know, it was a group effort. It wasn't just Spiros, but, it, you know, Spiros were part of the team. I Spiros and Linos and the Stop the Lockout group and, you know, all these great Sydney siders, um, the one of, committees. One of the one of the sort of the faults of a lot of the, 
this I call it like ivory tower thinking. Yeah. That these people locked away in cities watch Bambi and see Spiracy and things like this and they they have this romantic notion that we can live these lives where nothing dies, there's no cost to us being here. And I feel like it, it, it's quite naive. But, I mean, one, one thing I think you get out of spearfishing is when you're connected to your natural environment because you're in it, you're immersed in it and you're doing it, you develop a sense of awareness for the most part. There are exceptions, of course. And then that informs your conscious and you you know how hard it is to, to put food on your table from yeah. one end of it of the process to the other. So it makes you far more appreciative of the animals that you're spearfish, you know, sparing. Yeah, well, it's that, that I suppose it's that hunting instinct, but also it, it makes you acutely aware of your environment. Mm. Um, a lot of us will notice uh, particular species. Um, you know, the local group goes, oh, we've noticed a turtle with a bit of algae on its back. We've known about that turtle for months. Like we know exactly where it is and what it's doing. Yeah. Um, you know, most of it, you know, the locals will point the direction of, you know, if they need to go and rescue. Um Basically, just to go back as well, um, that it, that feeling you had, um, they actually named that. So it's intrinsic and bequest. So okay. it's the feeling of knowing that something is there even though you don't use it. So if you, uh, you know, one of my friends refers to them as the latte sippers in Sydney that go down snorkeling once a year um, at, at Clavelli yeah. and uh, buy themselves, a, you know, a Greenpeace shirt, uh, just the fact they know it's there. So that is actually part of those sanctuary zones, intrinsic and bequest. Yeah, so right. handed to them even though they don't use it. Just the public's happy that they know that it's there. Yeah, yeah. And it gives you a sense of like you're doing the right thing and your yeah. community's doing the right thing. Yeah. Well, the, whether they whether whether it is the right thing or not, what, they, it, well, that, this what, is they, the, what thing. the perception is, yeah. And, you know, like a lot of us want to see our children connect with the natural environment yep. and to not have to buy all of their food from the supermarket. And uh, I think it's there's a real joy in taking kids spearfishing and and just being involved in, in part of your whether it's hunting whether it's foraging whether it's fishing like just doing shit and not relying on someone to go through this you know manufactured process um, so that you can eat I, like I I don't know I just I it, it sort of I don't know I, I get I guess because it's not my worldview I, I find it confusing. Yeah, look, I've had some weird experiences down at the ramps where um, a parent will come up and say, do you mind if we, if the, fish, the kids watch you gut this fish? So, of course. And they're asking questions and they're interested and, yeah. and that kind of thing. And I was like, wow, like, and, and you know, they're almost, you know, they're almost got their fingers on the table and <laughs> they just want to see what's inside this fish yeah. and how it works. And seeing them light up with interest and they haven't been really corrupted in a sense of, you know, it's bad to eat this or it's good to eat this. They're just really interested in how hunting from beginning to end and how it all works. So that yeah. that is really cool. Um, when you see it in real life, it's, it's not like some movie where, you know, we're shooting like some exotic animal from, you know, 500 metres away and then mounting it and putting it on our wall. <laughs> like that, most of the time we're just getting a feed. And yeah. there's no real, there's no cruelty involved. Yes, something dies. Yeah. But like respect for your catch, like, you know, Treating it right from one end to the other, like, you know, like it's so nuanced. There's so much work involved in it. Yeah, well, and that's the thing as well. A lot of people will smash clubs about competitions and say, oh, you just go out and shoot everything. And mm. it's just, it really isn't really all the case. Yeah. Um, these clubs basically, it's hard to uh, put it completely into words, but there's this acceleration of process. So you go from, you know, just foraging around in the rocks and shooting your first couple little fish in the club and... You, you join the club and you go through and you learn a lot of species really quickly and you might go out and shoot your first few fish and you might go on, I want to shoot this and I want to shoot that. Mm. But it quickly accelerates you to, hey, that one species, I like that species and I like chasing that species. I want to go and take, whether it be a king or a snapper or even, you know, the humble brim you know, is one of my favourites and you really quickly get to hone in on those particular fish. And I know a lot of comp divers who are on their social dives they'll come home with nothing because they're like, I just want that one fish that I know I like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I, th I think, you know, the club diving actually te teaches ethics a lot quicker than, mm -hmm. than in, in, in any other ways. Um, and a lot of respect for the ocean. Um, that's, that's the most important thing. Talking about that, 
Cam and I were in Coffs and we managed to get out for a bit of a boat dive with Tommy and some of the Coffs Coast boys. And uh, jeepers, it was magic. We shot a king. I brought some king with us. Um, we've got some um, some cryovac bags in the car. Do you reckon we could whip it up for sashimi before we head down yeah, to the pub absolutely. Tonight? Let's yeah. do that. That'd I think cool, that'd be a good idea. Um, m- moving on a little bit. So, I mean, I mean, let, let's wrap up some of this advocacy stuff. For the average Spiro, um, what is your, you know, how can they be proactive in their area and, and get amongst it? Look, there's so many steps, but basically if you see um, any of the local groups, clubs, um, any of the big uh, AUF, USFA, um, or some of your really well-trusted presenters say, hey, you need to fill this out. It's about bag and size limits or it's about draft strategy plans. Please do it. Mm. You're actually the most important voice. The more of those boxes get ticked, the more of those surveys that get filled out, um, and it's really not hard work. Mm. Taking your five minutes to do that, taking 10 minutes to complain about it online and get into an argument with someone versus the five minutes it takes (laughs) just to fill it out will make a difference and it will make the community more powerful and stronger the more you do those things. There's no instant gratification. No. That's satisfying. (laughs) Anger. Back and forth. War on and comments yeah and um if you're really interested join your local clubs ask what you can do hey what can i do um check any of your uh whether you're in queensland or new south wales if there's any committees that harvest strategy groups or whatever that you can work with um and you're really interested in doing it do that um and find like-minded people Mm. and uh, really, so local local action groups. So if someone's trying to, you know, the local swimming group's trying to take your favourite spot where you like, you have safe access in and out of the water, um, join. Just tell them there's great whites there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 join, join up with five or ten people and go to your local minister's office and tell them what the ocean means to you, you know, um, and and how to respect it. Mm, that and joke would have been funnier 12 months ago before <laughs> it actually happened. <laughs> yeah. So sorry for the inappropriacy there. No, that's all right. Um, yeah, cool. Awesome, Simon. Um, mate, you've done you've done a great job lobbying and doing so, so much of this work. So massive thanks from, uh, from our community to you, mate. Do you like to penetrate? Great news. Penetrator Fins, today's Noob Spiro podcast sponsor, are tough as nails. Robust, dependable performers with beyond industry standard warranty. Communicate direct with Larry and his team 24-7 for all your fin inquiries at penetratorfins.com or at penetratorfins on Instagram. Baby bum finish. These things are smooth as silk. They glide through the water. They give you that awesome balance between power and efficiency. This is Penetrator Fins. Use the code Anoopspiro to save $25 on any pair of penetrator fins at penetratorfins.com. That's right. Use the code Noobspiro to save $25 on any pair of penetrator fins at penetratorfins.com. Kill fish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with Kill Shots spear guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American-made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any Kill Shot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Nuba. That's $30 off. American-made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. Simon, I reckon we haven't touched too much on your spearfishing journey. So seven years ago, it sounds like sort of when you started, and you went straight into a club. Well, I started with the classic Audi snorkel and fins package. Audi? Yeah, Audi. Like, I think it was 20 bucks for, like, you know, it was, like, the short fins and, like, the $20 you... snorkel and it would piss water in and it would yeah. just be, you know, you'd have a fish tank in front of your face before you'd even hit the water. Um, and then, uh, you know, upgraded from the local scuba store to a better snorkel and then... But even when you stuck your face in the water with the Audi mask, you, you were enjoying it. Yeah, just floating around and and seeing fish. And I um, was helping clean out my grandparents' house 10 or 15 years ago and I spotted this pole with a big spiky thing on top of it and I was like, what's that? And he goes, oh, your uncle used to spear fish when he thought he was cool. (laughs) uh, um, You know, this is when they lived in, you know, uh, French's Forest and 30 years ago or whatever and... um, 
Yeah, so I always thought about that and then I ended up buying the uh, the BCF Pulse Beer Special, I think everyone, the Mirage I think it's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I had the Audi fins and the Mirage Spear and I had a friend who said, oh, I've got a spear gun, Do you want to, I'll take you spear fishing and took me out and as everyone does, you know, taught me about the spear gun and then he just handed it to me and said, go and have a go. Um, and yeah, basically went from there and I said, oh, there's this club. And he's like, oh, you know, I don't know about clubs and blah, blah, blah. And I went, no, I'm going to go to the meeting. So I went to the meeting and, you know, a handful of years later I was uh, president. And <laughs> 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 oh, we found a sucker to do the job. Um, yeah. But, yeah, no. It's, an and, intelligent sucker. Yeah, an intelligent sucker. <laughs> but, yeah, and uh, those guys are just incredible. You know, we was, you know, away trips. Uh, we plan, the Sea Lions plan several uh, away trips a year. And one of our favourite ones is a three-hour trip north in the middle of winter and it's freezing and we've got this campground which is long drop toilets like and they stink and but you're allowed to have as big bonfire as you want. So we would just have huge bonfires. We'd go out, get some crazy fish, come back, cook it up and just have this awesome experience. Like, oh, wow. and, and Yeah, it's just so cool and, you know, the boys are planning, um, you know, liverboards. They go, um, we've got a few comp divers who... Great comp divers, but more importantly, just love the atmosphere. They yeah. they'll go all the way up to north to see the Coffs boys down down south for Eden. Um, you know, yeah, going nice. to Sydney for Sydney comps like they, and we run our own as well in yeah. February at the beginning of the year. We just love doing it. Yeah, sick. Yeah. So, in terms of learning, though, the club gave you access to a whole bunch of people. Yeah, and experience. And weirdly enough, it wasn't like a classroom. You yeah, know, stand nah. there. You just. You know, the first boat ride you jumped on. He goes, you haven't got any bananas on you? He said, no, no bananas. I've heard about this one. Um, you know, turned to me, said, hold on tight. And he had a, you know, 225 on a six metre and we just went off like the rockers. Wow. Um, and, yeah, I was just hooked since. And you jump in the water and they just see you do something and go, oh, you know, try going a little, you know, go down to that level or, you know, try not to dive bomb this fish and, and getting all... And from even from you know 16, 17 year olds who'd been diving for five or ten years already, you know their, their dads had them in the water you know, since they were babies, yeah, yeah. Um, all the way through to um, you know crazy experienced guys who've been in the water thirty or forty years. Um, just a little hints and tips, um, and and how to enjoy the dive as well. Um, we're not a crazy social, a crazy comp diving club. We're so. You know, we do have competitions, we do have trophies and stuff, but we even created a social membership because a lot of the guys just want to turn up with like minds, go spear fishing, yeah, yeah. have a drink afterwards, enjoy the day. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and it, it, it's such a cool experience to have that and um, the access to the knowledge you just wouldn't gain if yeah. you didn't join the club. Comps are a cool part of, of, of spearfishing too, but there's so much more like even with the podcast, people go, oh, do you just talk about spearfishing all the time? I go, no, nah, no, nah. I talk about Iyataku. I talk about yeah. underwater photography. I talk about marine biology. We talk about, you know, fisheries management. We talk yeah. about, you know, there's so much more to it than just that and even the comp divers, like it's great to sort of – come into a place where you're surrounded by a bunch of people who share a massive passion with you and then they maybe geek out on a couple of other little interesting things that you like too. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's funny you you even also have that melding of um, hunting on – so you have a few land hunters as well um, yeah. and you've got people from all walks of life. It is just crazy. You've got executives, you've got garbos, you've got, you know – Someone like myself who's been, you know, a mechanic and a parts interpreter uh, all in one room and mm. how passionate everyone is and how much fun everyone has is it's just crazy. And yeah, um, we basically just when, – when we've had the call to arms to do advocacy work, everyone's jumped in and done it, you know, yes. and, and then when it hasn't come to advocacy, we've just enjoyed our, our environment, our experiences on the coast. So – yeah, I couldn't talk any more highly of clubs. Clubs yeah. has just given me so much. Um, and So we're, we're the Central Coast Sea Lions, have you guys got a website, Facebook? Where can people come Facebook and connect page, with Facebook um, page yeah. and we're also uh, with some information about us on the USFA website as well. What's your sort of catchment? How far are people travelling? Um, we've got members in Barara, which is about an hour drive and yeah. we've got an, uh, members all the way up to not far off Newcastle. Oh. Um, so, yeah. The catchment's probably the Central Coast. We call ourselves the Central Coast Sea Lions. I've got yeah. the, the shirt on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah, basically along the Central Coast and that's where we run most of our comps on yeah. and then we travel north and south um, for away comps and, and state comps. Uh, so, yeah. 
So local diving, we were talking about the EAC. Occasionally it comes in close enough for people to shoot like marlins and, and, and kingies off the rocks if they're extremely lucky. Yeah, well, the, I think the most memorable one recently was a comp. Oh, geez. Uh, I, uh, he'll get me in trouble if I don't quote it exactly, but it was, it was within the last five years. Uh, four or five years ago, uh, mid-February, uh, a reef in five to ten metres of water just off the coast. Um, yeah, a 99 kilo marlin. So, oh, wow. Yeah, uh, during a competition. So, yeah, I think it was biggest and most notorious for that year. Um, and that was such a cool experience for him. Um, I suppose, as Albie's even said, one of the best divers in our club is going to hate that we bring it up again. But I think he's... he's, uh, he's Cord length's about 10 metres. You know, I th- he shoots the biggest and the best fish out of all of us and I don't think he dives deeper than 10 if he has yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah, he's incredible. He's a great guy. And, um, yeah, it, the Central Coast diving is – I'm sure there are people who on the Central Coast who dive very deep um, on, you know, big secluded reefs. But most of the access on the Central Coast uh, is not very deep um, and we just aim to try and shoot whatever fish you want. Um, in the least amount of time possible in your dive. Uh, it's just great. Um, you know, we've got everything from deeper reefs all the way up to, you know, great shore access, um, long sweeping headlands. And the difference between the Central Coast and some of the other more populated areas is uh, sometimes you might be lucky enough to be hitting a reef that you're the only one that will hit it that day. Um, yeah. And uh, you might be the only one on that headland that day or, or at least for that morning or that afternoon. So that's kind of cool as well, something we – we get to take advantage of um, and especially with, you know, some of the longer uh, uh, ones a little bit more further up north um, where you can really access it by boat or a long walk in. Um, yeah, we've, we've got a lot of access to places that really don't have any um, population linked to it. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Sensational, sensational. So the, the, the Sea Lions Club now, how many members you got? Um, last year it was 40, 40 something, um, which probably makes us one of the bigger clubs in Australia. Um, and we also have one of the, the most selective score sheets. We actually removed uh, quite a few species. We've even been in a good handful of arguments with other clubs about it. But yeah, yeah. Um, we, well before I was a president and well before, um, you know, I started, there was a, a group of people who just said, no, nah, we're just not going to shoot these species anymore. Um, you know, they took it to the club and the club agreed. Um, and, yes, and we've, every year we've suggested putting them back on and they've said no. So, yeah, we've, we've taken a handful off. And that's just our club. Other clubs are entitled to shoot and do as they please. You know, what their mum, members come to an agreement is what their club is. Um, and the most important thing is almost everyone has a respect for that. Um, the autonomy that the club has taken, the autonomy that other clubs taken. A lot of people have the respect for other clubs. You know, um, even some of the clubs down south with the AUF have a, I'm not 100%, it's a different, it doesn't even have a species per score. It's per, you know, points per species and then per kilo or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. So that's a really interesting outlook and that's what they do and, you know, their their autonomy for that is great as well. So Yeah, that's sensational. I think clubs should, not you know, adapt their score sheets to their environment and to the the sentiment and the knowledge that they have in their club. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, it's never been uh, a contentious issue for any of the members, yeah, yeah. <laughs> any of the Sea Lions members. But, yeah, and uh, so and we have, we've had a mix. You know, you occasionally get uh, – you, you won – 14, 15, 16-year-old kid who jumps in and, and they invite all their friends because they're having a great time and then you lose a handful of them to uh, cars and boobies. <laughs> and, I was and- going to talk to you about attrition. Like um, so many people start spearfishing. They yep. buy a big brand new set of gear. Um, getting in a club is a great way to reduce those attrition rates because you you can just – if you're surrounded by people that have even got the same problems as you, you realise it's not so overwhelming. No. But um, there's a lot, a lot of stuff to learn. It's quite hard. A lot of people persist. Like Spiros are generally very persistent people. <laughs> yeah. And they all share some similar characteristics. But um, what do you think the churn is? Like how many people are actually sticking with it beyond a couple of years um, or even I, that first year? I'd say – uh, it really depends on the year and how lucky they get. Sometimes you have a year where uh, almost everyone in the club seems to have a boat and, uh, you know, 10 boats turn up and 15 divers and you literally got to leave one at the dock um, and how good the year is, if, like how good the visibility has been that year, how many comps they've been to, yeah. if you've had a good run of fish, if if those divers who are brand new have had a good year. And then sometimes you have those years where the vis is rubbish 
there's one boat in the club. For sure. 30 people turn up. You know, you've got to rock off. You feel, and everyone does their time. Um, everyone even talks about it like an apprenticeship sometimes. Some of the older guys, you know, they were turning up to the club and doing comp dives for five years before anyone have even thought about inviting them onto a boat. Yeah. Um, so I think it's uh, how they perceive their experience, um, how committed they are and how good of the first year is um, or even the, the second year. On a good year, uh, how many dive days do you reckon you get off here with five metres or more visibility? Up here on the coast? On the coast, yeah. Oh, is this including being our, like, full-time work as well? <laughs> no, no, no. In theory, how many, like, is it, would it be one in three days? And not, obviously they're not all consistently like that. Like, oh, that's get blocks of good viz and then blocks of rubbish for us. Well, hours. with uh, La Nina, um, I, I don't even want to even imagine what that number's been. But before, you know, these crazy weather events and everything else, I would say um, – how many days could you die that's more than five metres of visibility? I think it's hard with a full-time job. If you were a kid who was frothing um, and had access all the time after after school or after work, I'd probably say maybe half the year or so. Wow. At least. Wow. Um, but, yeah. That's even, pretty good. Even people's interpretations of five metres is odd as well. My five metres is like a lot of people's three. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I personally think I'm all right in three metres. I'm still, I'll am still i still go. I'm not going to necessarily dive some of the deeper reef. I'm going to probably be picky with my dive buddy. Or, it depends, you know. But, um, yeah. But I like cr- shitty viz sometimes. Yeah, yeah. look. We've got a few divers in our club and funnily enough, it's um, we, we've got a few saffers in the club who are – and is that a derogatory term? I don't no. think. No, 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 no. A few South African Yarpies blokes. Pieces maybe. Yeah, and they <laughs> they love four-metre viz and yeah. they get excited. It's the perfect hunting. <laughs> like they, they get excited. Um, you know, half – oh, geez, I don't know. I'm still trying to think about how many days you get beyond five metres. Ten metres on the coast is the Coral Sea day. Like that's yeah. – that's a great day. And we do get the odd, you know, 20, 25 days. Wow. We've had those. Um, they're few and far between, but anything more, 10 or more on the coast is a pretty good day. Great news, guys. Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the Noob Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code Spiro, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one. There's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com, get Adam's course and use the code Spiro to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I could trust when I pull the trigger. Kill Shot Spear Guns utilize the finest of kiln dried Burmese teak. Kill Shot Spear Guns also combine American made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish. Get $30 off any Kill Shot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. In the world of freedive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden going to get you down and shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times. But there is a way to do it safer and smarter, take down more fuel to maximize the time that you have there. Learn at noobspearer.com forward slash TED with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. If you take down more fuel, you can stay for longer. Learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal. Ted breaks it down for you with a free online course, noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Take down 20 to 30% more air just by learning how to take a full breath. Again, learn how to do it free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. You've been plagued in recent years by some sinus issues. Now, have, yes. Have, uh, talk to us about that. And um, <laughs> I'm imagining you've been referred to an ear, nose, throat specialist. Walk us through your journey and what you've learned. Um, well, uh, probably about for six months, I suddenly, um, unrelated to diving, but around the same time I was diving, I had a flu at one point and I never quite kind of recovered and maybe it was before – 
that. Um, but I had headaches for six months, like just atrocious headaches. Eventually ended up in hospital with a, you know, very uh, stroke looking um, symptoms. Uh, and they found I'd had some uh, vertebrae out in my neck and an actual diagnosed uh, very deep sinusitis in the left nose. Um, and I have been referred to the specialist, um, which you can go to, but that surgery my father's actually just had as well. Um, you want to try and avoid at every point possible because every day after that uh, you're required to do your nasal drainage and you oh, can make wow. it worse if you don't. Um, so I've got the bottle here. I'll show you, uh, you know, as much as possible. Um, I've been a bit slack but I'm getting better every day doing a nasal rinse which feels like you're washing out the inside of your brain uh, with the salt water and um, the right things that my doctor's prescribing. I'm trying to get rid of the sinus problem and, and hoping the next time I'm able to get in the water that it that it's resolved. Um, and yeah, and lots of physio for the neck. So yeah, but the sinus issues, um, it started with I would dive uh, and towards the end of the day, it, I just couldn't equalize anymore. And now, now it's gotten to the point where uh, the worst days I've had two or three dives and that's it. I feel this like a, almost a click and it's gone. And, and the pressure is so bad that even on the surface of my head in the water, I have Reverse block almost. Yeah, yeah. So, and I can't, I've tried going down to a couple of meters, staying there, seeing if I can relieve it. Um, but yeah, obviously with the, the diagnosed sinusitis problem, it's a, a long journey to, to, and keep doing the the washouts and the the uh, sprays. And, and then eventually, if at all, um, you know, I was a uh, good friend, Simon Tripp has uh, recommended a doctor who knows diving, um, uh, ENT specialist in Sydney. So, I'll uh, doddle on him over to him if uh, if it, if I can't get it better with my GP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's a tricky one, man. Like everyone's got tricks with their ears too. Like some people just have no issues. Some people dive new places and find they get uh, infections until their body sort of adapts or gets the right microbiome, I guess, in their yeah. ears to fight it off or whatever. Um, I do get um, sore ears sometimes after multi-day diving. I get seasonal allergies. Sometimes I'll get reverse blocks and headaches. But for the most part, I've been pretty pretty blessed. So Yeah, making sure that someone who knows what they're doing is checking your techniques yeah. um, and the most efficient way to dive, um, trying to avoid those sinus issues and blocks. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm looking forward to it not being around anymore because – Sitting on a boat for half a day after two dives is, is pretty is pretty depressing. But that's your mates right. will be happy. They got a permanent boaty. Oh yeah, they've been loving it recently. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be out with a bunch of guys, and someone will go, "Oh, I'm really cold." I'll, I'll, I'll go, "I'll go." Are you sure? Like far out, the diving's really good. Like, oh no, I've got to warm up. I'm like, oh, all right, I'll I'll just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one of those divers in the club. Yeah. He could be in an eight mil suit in winter, and he'd still be too cold for him, and yeah. he'll he'll be on the boat after three dives. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's the way it is. <laughs> yeah, you got um. I guess sometimes you get a bit of colder water down here. Um, surface air, like getting sort of a growth inside, is that a bit of a thing down here? Um, yeah. Wind I've, chill and all the rest of it? I'm not 100% certain with – well, 100% sure with with such long-time experience, um, but I know a lot of surfers who get uh, one particular side of their ear drilled out because it's the side that faces south when you're out in the yeah. when you're out in the lineup. Um which I suppose, which way would it be? The right hand side. <laughs> um, yeah, one side of the ear drilled out. A lot of surfers getting um, getting that side done. Uh, but yeah, not with as There's much known from experience from from spear fishing. Mm-hmm. But I know there's a few of you know threatened the GPs to they'll go somewhere else to get their ears done <laughs> if they don't get it done for them. For you, Simon, we've talked a lot about sort of some of the background stuff to spear. And what about actual like a fish for you that sticks out, something memorable that you've taken at one oh. point in your diving? Tell you what, the first uh, first or second big king, um, the second big king was on, you know, a reef out in deep. It was my fish. Uh, you know, the contentious uh, second shot wasn't in there. It was one shot, one fish, no one else helped. Um, it was in, uh, you know, a pretty decent amount of water. It was in a place as known for big sharks. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, that was really memorable and probably the second one. And it sounds ridiculous. And I've answered this question before at, uh, at Adreno when someone asked me the same one online 
was my first Benito. It was actually a club comp. We had a boat packed out with people. We were just vibing, you know, just enjoying it. Everyone's just having a great day diving. The fish were on. There was kings. There was everything else. And it was the first time I'd shot a Benito and I'd actually had been handed the best advice. He goes, you know, one of my friends turned to me and he said, uh, you know all that stuff they say about, you know, sneaking and being, he goes, Benito opposite, swim at them as fast as you possibly can and they'll actually turn broadside to look at you for a second. Yeah. And, and I did that and it was the, it's the only fish that works on. You can't do, you know, I'm sure there are a couple others, but yeah, it's one of the only types of fish is if you swim as fast as possible at them um, and, and act like, you know, a big shark or whatever, they, they turn and look at you. Um, so, yeah, it turned broadside, took the shot. It was a decent bonito and there's a funny photo on the boat of, you know, someone trying to hunt my leg and, and <laughs> yeah, it was a great day. Um, that was just such a cool experience and it was a bit of fun and, um, you know, it was another thing to tick off the list. Um, being told a piece of information, putting it into action and taking the fish, like that was really cool. Equalising problems can be something that derail you. Not today, my friend. Go to freedivingfamily.com. Check out the, either the Friends with Advanced Friends or Video or the Mouthful and Deep Friends or Equalisation course at freedivingfamily.com. You can use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. These courses are put together by Adam Stern and a select team of, of, of legends and to help you overcome different issues and help you perform better. And some of them are extremely relevant for freedive spearing. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Shrek, my dude, you're killing it on the Noob Spiro podcast. Every guest you get on frosts on the spearing life and the actionable info is off the chain. Over here at Spearing Magazine HQ, it's the same, buddy. So many noobers are submitting their adventures, lessons learned, and pictures here at spearingmagazine.com. Just wanted to say that uh, noobers can get an international subscription here at spearingmagazine.com. They can also check out our In the Face Apparel or getting a subscription to the world's greatest spearing magazine. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. Shrek, thanks. Love what you're doing. Jeremy out. Yeah, it's one thing hearing it, it's another turning it into, into yeah, reality. That's yeah, that's exactly right. There's a lot of ple- pleasure in, I think, that spearfishing journey, that journey of mastery. Yeah. Even if it's a very small part at a time, you know. Yeah, it, it's that experience you have of um, the small piece of information – the action you had to take to to turn that into something, and then the outcome, um, yeah, and it's just such a a really cool part of the journey, and I I still enjoy it, you know, to this day, um, doing that, and I think each even the most experienced spiros, um, I would hope, still have a new experience every time they're in the ocean, because um, I. You know, I'm not experienced at all, but every time I get in the ocean, something's new, something's exciting, something's different, a fish pattern's different. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Let's finish off with two more questions, Simon. We're going to head out to the to the club and catch up with the boys a bit later, so yep. it's going to be good. And you'll be there for a bit of that conversation too. Hopefully we can record it. Um, for you, spearfishing destination, dream spearfishing destination. Uh, I think I've probably watched too many Ascension Island videos. <laughs> um, yeah, somewhere where the fish are plentiful, everyone's enjoying themselves, everyone's safe, and there's no sharks stealing your food. <laughs> there's plenty of sharks at Ascension. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know, I know. Yeah, some yeah. somewhere uh, the magical island of uh, no sharks and lots of fish. <laughs> <laughs> um, last question: What does the spearfishing experience means to you now, with all these hard years of um, battles behind you? I woke up when I first started spearfishing one day um, and I kind of went, we deserve to get a wetsuit on or pick up a fishing line or take the kids down to the beach and not worry about if you're in a, marine, if you're in a sanctuary. Mm. We deserve that. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have any rules. We need proper management of our stock and species. Um, we need more user engagement. Um, but we deserve to, and that's that was my, that was what I believed. I believed that we deserve to be able to go out and spearfish. Mm. And I still believe that. Mm. I still believe that you have the right to uh, access to the marine estate, um, fair and adequate uh, access to the marine estate. And uh, that's what spearfishing means to me and what, what representing spearfishing meant to me um, now that I've stepped aside is everyone deserves that right. Mm. 
And it's also a privilege as well um, to be able to enjoy the ocean. And uh, what that means to me now is there's a lot of people who can take a very small action and turn it into a big one, whether you join a local club or a local group, um, even on Facebook. Take the opportunity you have not just to argue with each other but fill out the submissions if someone's asked because it's, it's really important. Um, barrack your local members um, and let your story be heard and most importantly, sharing with your family or even your friends at work who don't spearfish and, and really sharing your experience saying, you know, I got to take this fish and I fed it to the family and all oh, this fish that we're bringing to lunch, you know, I, I took this yesterday and, and that was a great experience for me and making sure that they understand how much spearfishing means to you yeah, um, and when you ask for that help, they will help you, uh, most importantly. And, and enjoyment, getting out there, having fun. Um, you know, I'm a complete hack, but I still enjoy doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, mate. Um, awesome to chat with you, Simon, and great to meet in person. Um, your number has been given out to too many people who ring you all the time yeah. about different things. <laughs> but um, where can people come and find you online if, uh, if that's possible? Uh, generally because I've taken a step aside, um, if you see me say something, it's probably because I've thought it out. Um, so if you see me say something online, but you can always find me on Facebook. You can find me um, so on… So Simon Horvath on Facebook. Yep. Instagram. Yep. Uh I don't even use it properly. I think I've got it somewhere. <laughs> I should really top that up. No, nah, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm struggling to use mine too. So yeah, yeah. Uh, most importantly, instead of finding me, finding like minds and finding it within yourself to make sure that you can properly represent spearfishing to family, <laughs> friends, and your local communities. Um, you know, the most important thing, I suppose, is uh, something that someone else says is uh, every time you put on the wetsuit, you're putting on a business suit and representing your community. So do the best you can and enjoy it. Love it, mate. Awesome. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed Simon Horvath. If nothing else, it's a, a fantastic call to join your local spearfishing club so blokes like him can get up there and represent people like you and me and preserve our spearfishing and fishing access into the future. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's convo. Next week, it's the Central Coast uh, Sea Lions Spearfishing Club. We have a round table with a bunch of great personalities and talk. It's actually a really lively conversation. The booze was thrown flowing freely and uh i hope you enjoy that as well i really enjoyed doing this trip it was powered by patron listeners just like you if you go to patreon.com forward slash noob spiro you can jump on there as well and support the podcast on an episode by episode basis it pays for me to get out and do trips like this and go and interview legends in person and go spearfishing with them and have an absolute ball of a time I absolutely love doing it and uh, a couple of parts left in this. There's part four and part five before we get to a massive episode 200. As I mentioned at the start of the podcast, I'd love it if you went to noobspero.com, left me a voice message. Tell me what you love about the Noobsphere podcast. I will try and get it in episode 200 and uh, that'll be fantastic. So go to noobspero.com, head up into the menu, find Nooba Stories and you can record a voice message right there and then. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Um, you guys, as usual, are awesome and it's an absolute pleasure recording this podcast, making it for people like you that just froth on listening to this podcast. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Next week, part four, Australian East Coast Invasion. All good guys, catch ya. Today's episode was an absolute banger and so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment. You can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can even use that code in-store at some of their huge mega stores Australia-wide. Price be guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear. The NoobSpear podcast is incredibly proud to be partnering with Neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works, equipment you can rely on. It's the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Neptonics is also the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing gear, particularly in the US. They've got free shipping on all orders over $99 in the US. Furthermore, you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off on your entire shopping basket at Neptonics.com. Use the code NOOBSPIRO at Neptonics.com.